can be silent. Um, the reasons that we will often see it is because we have a light plane of anesthesia, and what will happen is the patient has an endotracheal tube in. We see this sometimes um, you know, in our neurosurface, probably more than any, when we're trying to get out. <laughs> and the patient reflex, then we have to do all this extra work. Um, but no, it'll be because during an MRI, for example, we're not doing anything surgical to the patient. The patient is a very light plane of anesthesia, and then we wake them up or we move them, and suddenly the patient starts <coughs> because they feel the endotracheal tube. Well, what that does is increase intra-abdominal pressure. What happens when you increase intra-abdominal pressure against a, a lower esophageal sphincter that has decreased tone? Your reflux, right? And then the next thing you know, you've got a bunch of gastric material sitting inside your esophagus. And when that happens, you know, the other thing I think that's really key is you do have to clean it out. And it's not just wiping out the mouth. When you just wipe out the mouth, yes, the patient probably won't aspirate, which is good, but you still got all this material that's sitting down in the esophagus that's irritating it. And if it just continues to sit there for the next hour in that patient, you can get an esophagitis, and that esophagitis can lead to more reflux, and this patient can go on eventually to develop a stricture, okay? So what we do is I really advocate rinsing the esophagus, and this is what becomes a bit of a pain in the butt because we've got to take a red rubber feeding tube, we feed it down into the esophagus, we flush through water, and we just use tap water. I don't use any bicarbonate to reduce the pH, just tap water, and then we have to suck it back out, and rinse it, and suck it back out, rinse it, and suck it back out until it comes back clear. So it's a lot of work, um, but, you know, it's worth it, okay? So the bigger thing about gastroesophageal reflux, though, is if you can prevent it from ever occurring, that's even better. So just keep your patient at a good plane of anesthesia. Anything you stick down into the esophagus will stimulate them to have, or will increase your incidence of reflux as well. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. If you're using esophageal stethoscopes, don't shove them all the way into the stomach. That's not where they need to be. Just put them down. Listen like a sculpt as you're putting it down until you just start hearing the sounds. Because the closer you get to the lower esophageal sphincter, the more likely you are to get um, reflux. That's the other reason that we don't tend to use esophageal temperature probes. We tend to take the temperature through the nose just because I don't really want esophageal temperature probes sitting down in the esophagus. Yeah, so when we, the question is, what do we do when we rinse them? Well, what we do is we just leave them in lateral recumbency, typically. Um, we're, we're, we're fortunate we've got overhead suction in the hospital, and we have suction. So really what we do is we take a suction catheter, stick a suction catheter down, we suction out everything that we can, and then we just take the red rubber feeding tube, feed it in beside the suction catheter. And this is a situation where it's probably nice to use a laryngoscope to make sure you're not shoving that catheter down into the lung, which could potentially happen if you're very forceful. Um, and then we just go ahead and rinse with the water and suction until it comes back clear and then we call it good and then yeah but it can be it's, it's an ex, a lot of extra work and any of the texts that I work with that we now have to do this they don't really like it I don't either because it always happens at 6 30 or something as I'm trying to get out the door um, so again, prevention is the big one, um, suction and flush with water. Um, when we have a patient that we know um, did have gastroesophageal reflux, we tend to in extubate them in sternal, um, just so that if there is any material that's still sitting in that esophagus, it runs back rather than running up into the mouth. Um, I do extubate them with the cuff slightly inflated because if that reflux had gotten up into the mouth and then trickled back down into the trachea, I like to, if the cuff's partially inflated, I can pull the cuff out and pull the material with it. Um, so I do leave the cuff slightly inflated. Um, we do use some pre pre uh, protective medications. Most of our patients actually get an H2 blocker from motidine prior to anesthesia. It's not to prevent gastroesophageal reflux. It's to reduce gastric pH so that if reflux does occur, it's less acidic. Um, you could give them things like um, proton pump inhibitors. We could give them metoclopramide, all these other sort of things. But none of them have been, ever been shown to be that effective. Um, and since I've, uh, I've got to quit, I'm going to quit here. I'll just, I was going to talk about recovery complications next. But um, yeah, so I'll stop. I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. But before I take questions, I just have to one thing. Boringer Ingelheim um, gave us a book to give out. It's a cardiology book, Cardiovascular Disease and Small um, Animal Medicine. We didn't really know that we were going to have this draw available. And so what we've done is if you look under your chair, someone's sitting in a chair with a pen taped to the bottom of it. That person, this is your book. Did anyone find it? See, maybe no one's sitting in the chair the pen's under. Keep looking. It should be it, it should be taped on there with some masking tape. Did someone find it? Oh, there we go. Okay. So you can grab your book after. Good job.
Uh, but do you guys have any questions I can answer? And then I'll let you go get your coffee. No questions? It was clear? OK. Megan. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So the question was, um, cats um, don't have dopamine re dopaminergic receptors on the kidneys, and so why would we use dopamine in cats um, for increasing or f during anesthesia to improve renal perfusion? Um, the whole thing about the dopamine receptors in cats is sort of questionable because there's also studies that suggest they might have dopamine receptors. Um, they may not be the same, but we're actually not going after the dopamine receptor when we're using dopamine in the cat. We're actually going after the beta-1 receptor at the heart to increase contractility of the heart. So we're not actually using the dopamine receptor um, in that instance. We're actually primarily targeting the beta-1 receptor. And this is the thing about dopamine. It has different effects at different doses. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Yes? Uh, I have a question about for um, during surgery to reward warming cats. There's not a lot of products available that are really effective at warming like extremities and stuff. What do you guys use? Uh, warming was one of the things I was going to talk about is hypothermia. Um, why we become hypothermic and all the rest. Um, the best thing is actually a bear hugger or a hot dog. Um, I don't know if you've seen either of those. Well, that's the, yeah, that, so, yeah, so uh, the hot dog's kind of neat because you can wrap around the patient and that's really cool and it's much smaller and it doesn't make all the noise and everything. The other thing is the bear hugger, you can actually get very small reusable blankets for it. It does, you don't have to get those uh, really expensive long tubes that are like 10 feet long. And um, if you go to Jorvet, um, we've actually just bought some of these for our hospital. They have reusable um, bags that you can use and they're very different, like they're all kinds of different sizes and they make some that are really nice and small for cats. And essentially all it is is a cloth bag and on one side of the cloth, ba cloth bag they have windproof nylon so that the air comes out one side of the bag and the other side it doesn't come out. But you can throw them in the washing machine, they'll last for probably two years and they're way cheaper. So that's what, it, that's what we're going to start using on some of the really small patients. But before we were taking that stupid long snake and tying knots in it and uh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But that is, that is probably, like that's been clearly shown to be the most effective way of rewarming patients. And the thing with hypothermia is there's an obligatory drop in temperature that's going to occur no matter what you guys do unless you warm the skin to the same temperature as core body temperature. There will be a drop in temperature. Um, and all you can do is try and rewarm that patient through the skin because what you do is, the reason that you become cold during anesthesia is because there's a gradient between your core body temperature and your peripheral body temperature. And when you anesthetize the patient, the vasomotor tone that maintains that difference goes away. And so now all your warm core body temperature goes out to the periphery and cools you down. And so the only way to rewarm you is to warm your periphery so that the blood coming from your core that's circulating out in those areas actually warms up. All the other things that people want to use, like warming IV fluids, all these things, none of them have ever been shown to be that effective um, at rewarming. They're good for helping prevent loss of temperature, but the only thing that really rewarms are things that are going to rewarm the surface of the animal. Like heating lamps will work fine too. It's just you worry about burns and stuff like that. And I, I guess another, just since, we can, if can I just have two more minutes of your time just to put another plug in? I'm not a big fan of non-thermostatically controlled um, warming devices. Um, I've just seen too many patients burned by those discs that you throw in the microwave, the patient lies on them. I've seen patients burned with oat bags. Um, so I actually tend to try and discourage their use. Um, but a lot of people just love them and think they're the bomb. I personally would get, them, get rid of them altogether if I could. Yeah, that, yeah that's, that's when it makes more sense to use a non-thermostatically controlled um, device is when the patient can move away from it, right? Like, they have that option if they're getting too warm. Now, if the patient's sedated heavily, they may not move away as, as readily. Um, but the thing is that you also have to understand that, you know, uh, something that's warmed up to, say, 40, 
42, 43 degrees, that may not burn you like when you just touch it like this, but if you lie on it for 45 minutes, it could burn you. So, so that's the reason that these non-thermostatically controlled units, I really am not a big advocate of them. Um, I also think they're way labor intensive and you know, I always make the analogy, if you have a bear hugger, use your bear hugger because you know, it's, the analogy is based, instead of oat bags and stuff, it's basically like I've got a snow plow to plow my driveway or I've got my shovel. Well, yeah, I can use my shovel, which would be the oat bags, but if I've got the snow plow, just use my snow plow because it's going to do the job. You know what I mean? You don't need both. So, you know, the bear huggers are definitely worth their weight in gold, although I hate that they're so expensive. They're just a fancy hair dryer. But anyway, okay, I'll let you guys go. Go to the coffee break. Thanks for your attention.